Well, good morning. You are so welcome to be joining with us here at Central um, this Sunday morning. And um, we just want to say that um, wherever you're, you're joining us from, um, whether this is your first time with us or you've been with us before, we're just so glad that you are choosing to jump in with us um, today. There's not too many announcements other than um, this is another uh, month that we are given towards um, our compassion ministry with Storehouse. And um, they're collecting over at their warehouse over in Dunmurray. Um, and this month they're collecting, we have to collect um, pasta sauce. So if you wanna pick one up when you're out um, on your Tesco shop this week and in the coming weeks and just drop it over to them, they have a contactless drop off um, and you can give um, towards uh, the work that they're doing. They've so far in this lockdown sort of time, they have donated over a thousand food hampers, which you have helped contribute to. And we just wanna say thank you. I just wanna say thank you as I try and sort of navigate the compassion ministry through this season. You can do that over at their warehouse, um, which is unit four in the Kilwee estate over in Dunmurray. Um, the only other thing that we can want to highlight is that this week past was a communities week, um, and hopefully you are working your way through the E100 series. If you um, have been jumping in with us over the last few while and you want to get involved with a community, um, do reach out and we will try and get, um, want, get you situated into one that is near you. If you email us at central at carmoney.org, we will try and find one that is close to you. That's kind of really everything that um, we want to highlight to you before we kick off our service. Um, and we just want to say on behalf of the leadership and of Dave and of Joy, we just, um, they want to just continue to say thank you for your prayers and your support for them. They have really valued that as you have given them the space and the time to um, just process all that's going on um, with them. I just want to read a psalm this morning, um, just before we kick off into our service and then pray, and then we will continue with this morning's content. And the psalm I want to read is Psalm 84. And this is what it says. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of heaven's armies. I long, yes, I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord. With my whole being, body and soul, I will shout joyfully to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow builds her nest and raises her young at the place near the altar. O Lord of heaven's armies, my King and my God, what joy for those who can live in your house, always singing your praises. What joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord. Those who have set their minds on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. When they walk through the valley of weeping, it will become a place of refreshing springs. The autumn rain will clothe it with blessings. They will continue to grow stronger and each of them will appear before God in Jerusalem. O Lord God of heaven, of heaven's armies, hear my prayer. Listen, O God of Jacob. O God, look with favor upon the king, our shield. Show favor to the one you have anointed. A single day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than live the good life in the homes of the wicked, for the Lord God is our sun and our shield. He gives us grace and glory. The Lord will uphold no good thing, withhold no good thing from those who do right. O Lord God of heaven's armies, what joy for those who trust in you. God, this morning we just come before you and we come to that dwelling place and we're so thankful that that dwelling place is not confined to a building where we would gather corporately but we're, wherever we are this morning you are with us meeting us in our place of need in the comfort of our homes you're drawn near to us 
And we just pray this morning, God, that you would lead us in this time, that we would really experience the goodness um, of your spirit, that we would know the closeness of your spirit this morning with us. Would you come and teach us what you have to teach us? Would you give us soft hearts and ears to hear what it is you have to say to us? And it's in your name that I pray. Amen. If you have been with us over the last six weeks, you will know that we have been working through our Emotionally Healthy Spirituality series based off of the book by Pete Scazzaro. And so far, um, just to recap really quickly, um, we have looked at looking beneath the surface, breaking the power of the past, embracing our brokenness, receiving the gifts of limits. Um, we've looked at grief and loss and the incarnation and loving well. And in all of these principles, we have found that it is that emotional health and spiritual maturity are inseparable. And to live a spiritually mature life, we need to be emotionally healthy. And today we are coming to the final principle in this series. And I believe that much of what we have learned to this point through this whole series finds its home in this last principle. And the principle that we're looking at this morning is slowing down. And to frame it, I just want to look at a short passage in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. And this is what it says. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Mary was distracted by all the preparations she had to make. She came to him and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You're worried and upset about many things, but few of these things are needed. Only indeed one. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken from her. And we thank God for his word. And that still speaks today. The world is fast. You don't need me to tell you that, whether you've just placed an Amazon order and you're waiting for your next day delivery, and whether you find it really difficult to stay within 30 miles an hour in a 30 zone, or maybe like me, you're struggling to keep up with the relentless surge of news that is coming at us from every angle, every angle all of the time. And whether we realize it or not, the world that we live in continues to condition us to be in hot pursuit of life in the fast lane. A recent survey by Remigal was carried out on 550 adults, aged 25 and up across the UK, and these were just some of the results. One in five admits taking work home to finish over the weekend, while half reported feeling stressed at the weekend at least once a month. More than half admitted to passing through red traffic lights. Almost three quarters said that they would hang up the phone rather than wait on hold. And six out of 10 will fill their weekend with shopping, doing chores, visiting family, and catching up with friends. However, the survey stated that they would much rather be at home doing nothing. So the next time you're having a social distance gathering outside with the 10 of your friends, half of them really just wish they were at home binging Netflix. We are people who are moving 100 miles an hour and we're encouraged to keep it up. I come from quite an athletic family and I still remember the first time that my dad ever took me on a run. I was about eight years old and we were staying up at my caravan on the North Coast. It was one of those beautiful summer mornings and we headed out towards Mosaddin Temple. And about 20 or 30 seconds into that run, I, it didn't quite feel right. The run didn't quite feel how I anticipated it to be. And I, I turned to my dad and I asked, so when are we supposed to start sprinting? To which he replied, well, we're not. We are a people who are conditioned to live life as fast as possible. Speed is encouraged all around. You'll find that every new technology that is 
created boasts about its speed in an attempt for us to buy their latest product. The iPhone 11, which came out this year, is powered by the Apple A13 Bionic chip, and which is faster than any Android phone and any lower-end laptop. Virgin Media have produced um, their fastest broadband yet with the ultra fiber optic broadband. This is a broadband that is actually too fast for the majority of homes in the UK and it's because of its speed and homes are just simply not wired to cope with its speed. And even the speed at which we learn has increased since the beginning of time. Up until the 1900s, it is reckoned that it took about 100 years for human knowledge to double. By the end of 1945, that rate was down from 100 years to 25 years. And now in 2020, with the help of the internet and many news outlets, our human knowledge is thought to expand and double every 12 hours. That's twice a day our human knowledge has the capacity to double, and no doubt that will continue to get faster. Speed has become an epidemic and we are all sick. As John Mark Comer writes in his book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, he writes that hurry is violence on the soul. And there's even been a medical diagnosis coined by Mayor Friedman, an American cardiologist, and he coined this hurry sickness which is a mixture of anxiety and continual feelings of urgency. So this is not just a spiritual thing, this is physical and psychological as well. Speed is the way of the world, but it was never Jesus' way. And in order to live emotionally healthy spiritual lives, we must slow down. And we have to because the life that we are becoming more and more conditioned to live is simply not sustainable. And there's just two things that I want to focus on this morning to help us think about slowing down in order that we live as emotionally healthy and as spiritually mature followers of Jesus as we can. And they are slowing and sitting. And the first is slowing. Now this might seem obvious but just go with me on this because although it might be obvious we aren't exactly the best at practicing this well it's been written that life is a series of moments and throughout history there has been many different pivotal moments and these pivotal moments often become the defining moments of generations and certain years in history so for example in 1760 um, it was the beginning of four industrial revolutions in Europe and in the US. 2007 marked the official beginning of the digital age. 2016 marked the Brexit era, which we're still living in. And 2020 will no doubt be defined by the coronavirus pandemic. And like these pivotal moments through history, the church has experienced its own defining moments as well. And these defining moments often help bring the church towards a greater Christ-likeness and point the watching world towards Jesus. And often these moments happen in the form of what we know to be called revivals. So to name a few, in 1859, there was the Ulster Revival here in our country. In 1904, we had the Welsh Revival. In 1909, we had the Chile Revival, which spread through America, Asia, and Africa. And the thing about revivals is that they often start within us. Growing up, I would hear this term revival quite a lot, you know, growing up in a church circle and in, in church all of my life, I would hear this term revival, and it was always in this historic sense, you know. And this image that it kind of conjured up in my in my mind was this sort of this sort of Holy Spirit bomb that God would just drop on a certain people or a certain place or a people group. And in that moment when that bomb would go off and people would, you know, start to meet Jesus and they would meet God in, in those very moments and so many people would come to faith in him. And where that could be possible, we serve a God who does the impossible. But more commonly 
for us to see revival out there, it has to happen in here first. Pete Scazzaro writes, as your inner life is transformed, your outer world will change as well. And in order for, for our inner lives to be transformed, we must denounce speed in our lives. And that's why slowing down is so important. However, it's really important that we frame this concept of slowing because this is not a new thing. Slowing is synonymous with Sabbath. In his book, The Life You Always Wanted, John Ortberg defines slowing as cultivating presence by deliberately choosing to place ourselves in positions where we simply have to wait. So this idea of slowing is just one of the many byproducts of Sabbath. And Sabbath is an ancient practice. And we see God himself modeling this. In Genesis 2, 2, it says these words. By the seventh day, God had finished all the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. As well, we see Jesus himself address the topic of Sabbath. You know, his whole life was marked with Sabbath keeping, but he also speaks directly to the subject. In Mark 2, 27 and 28, Jesus says these words. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even on the Sabbath. Daniel Akin, a biblical scholar, articulates what Jesus means here when he writes these words. The Sabbath was made to bless man, not man to bless the Sabbath. Jesus' liberating vision of the Sabbath frees us from legalistic constraint instead of binding us with unbearable burdens. So the whole point of Sabbath is to bless and enrich our lives and giving ourselves permission to slow down in a speed addicted world, in a speed drunk world. Sabbath is exactly what we need and it's exactly what God designed for us. And just like many of the moments that I mentioned before, I really believe that we, as the Christian church in 2020, are heading towards one of these defining moments. As we endure this coronavirus pandemic, I believe God is starting to instill something in us again. I don't know about you, but it seems that just about every Zoom call that I have begrudgingly been a part of over the last three months, confession, I am so done with Zoom. But it seems that just about every Zoom call that I have been a part of, someone on the call has come to the revelation that they think God might be teaching us to slow down. And as cliche as that has become in such a quick period of time, it's true, isn't it? But slowing doesn't happen to you. It is a choice. It is an active resistance. And in some ways, I think that's why we struggle to ever fully practice slowing because our world is fast and it's unrelenting and it's evangelism of living life in the fast lane. It's not in our nature to go slow. And even as we've been locked up in our homes, unable to go anywhere for so long, unable to see the people that we love, some of us unable to go to work, we can still continue to live lives as we did before we were ever locked down, before we were ever in this pandemic, if we don't choose to slow down. And the likelihood is that if you're anything like me, your screen time is probably dramatically increased and your consumption levels or have risen like never before. With the increase of online shopping, the Telegraph have predicted that Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, is likely to become the world's first trillionaire by 2026 due to the rise of online shopping because of the coronavirus. And while online shopping and increased screen time are completely understandable and unavoidable, in this moment, it only reinforces the point that if we want to slow down, we have to choose it. And when we make the conscious choice to slow down our lives, we are participating 
in the choice to follow Jesus in his way. Jesus was rarely in a hurry. We see this all through the Gospels because hurry is incompatible with who he was. Last week we learned and we were reminded that he is the incarnation of love and the greatest commandment that he ever gave us was to love him with all of our soul, mind and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And you simply cannot rush love. E-harmony, as I mentioned in the last sermon that I preached, tells us that we can find love every 14 minutes. And I believe that that is just a lie because you cannot rush love. Similarly, joy and peace are core values of Jesus and they cannot be rushed either. John Mark Comer writes this, all of the spiritual masters from inside and outside the Jesus tradition agree on this one. If there's a secret to happiness, it's simple. Presence to the moment. The more present we are to the now, the more joy we tap into. We can never live with the fullest form and the fullest expression of the joy of the Lord if we are constantly rushing past the moment that we are in. And that's something that we see Jesus never, ever do. Likewise, we cannot be peaceful in a hurry. Them two things are just complete polar opposites. We in Northern Ireland know this all too well as we've been part of a peace process over the last number of years. Peace is a process and it simply cannot be rushed. So when we choose Sabbath, when we choose to set aside time in our day and in our weeks, where we let slowness take the lead, we are tapping into what God designed for us. When we put our phone away, when we take time to express our thanks and our gratitude for everything that God has given us and done for us, when we take time to worship him from our homes, slowness is a gift and it's a choice. And we must choose to be slow. We must choose to slow down if we're ever gonna live emotionally healthy lives. So we have slowing on one hand, but on the other thing that we wanna look at, that I wanna look at this morning, that I think will help us live emotionally healthy and spiritually mature lives is sitting. Sitting, a, f- a few moments ago, I, I read the story of Mary and Martha as they welcome Jesus into their home as he is on his way to Jerusalem. And just before we look at a few elements of that story, I just have to say from the outset, this is not a one got it right, one got it wrong, who are you gonna be in the story kind of narrative. It's not the lesson that is written in this story. And although on the surface that might make for quite um, a clear understanding of the passage, and, and there are probably elements of truth in that, that is not the overarching lesson, lesson of this story. N.T. Wright says this on the passage, we would be wrong then to see Martha and Mary as they've often been seen as models of active and contemplative styles of spirituality. Action and contemplation are, of course, both important. But the reason I chose to look at this passage this morning was because of the posture that Mary holds in the story and why the example that she set is extremely important for the church right now. And furthermore, why why sitting might just be one of the catalysts for the defining moments in the church right now. The infamous Mr. Burns from the TV show, The Simpsons once said, ah yes, sitting the great leveler, from the mightiest pharaoh to the lowest peasant, who doesn't enjoy a good sit? And it's true, there's often something so enjoyable about sitting down, especially after a long day or a long week of being out and about, of making our way through our our to-do lists or of looking after our kids, there's something so refreshing about finally getting to sit down. As I mentioned, my family on a caravan on the North Coast and I spent so many weekends and and summers of my life up there. 
And one of the things about spending so much time up there is the absurd amount of walking we do every time we go. Every day seems to be planned around walking. We'll go on two, three, maybe even four walks every single day. Sometimes we'll get into the car, drive somewhere just to walk when we get out the other side. And you know, it's something that we've always done and regardless of the weather, we'll be walking so it could be absolutely pouring down with rain and there'll maybe be a five minute window and we will grab that and we will go for the walk and it's often met with the, the phrase, oh sure, we'll go anyway, we'll chance it. Our days are filled with walking, but by the time we get to the end of the last walk of the day, by the time we're back and we're inside, there's this sense of relief and exhale when we finally sit down, and it's often teamed with the phrase, it's so good to sit down. And sitting is so important when it comes to slowing. Mary chose to sit down in the story, but she didn't just sit anywhere, but she could have, I mean, in reality, this was her house. She could sit anywhere she liked, but her decision to slow down and to sit right at the feet of Jesus was the declaration of her intent. This was a posture of discipleship, of her apprenticeship to Jesus. And he write comments on Mary's posture like this, to sit at someone's feet meant quite simply to be their student. And it's so important that we get this because sitting is one of the counterparts to slowing. Eugene Peterson also translated Mary's posture as sitting before the master, hanging on every word he said. As we choose to slow, we must also posture our hearts to sit right at Jesus' feet, to allow ourselves to hang on his very words and his revelations, to allow his words to sink deep into our hearts and transform our inner lives. But don't get me wrong, I'm not speaking as though this is easy. As I've been writing and preparing for today, I find this topic massively challenging again. This is a lot easier said than done because life keeps happening, doesn't it? It keeps moving, it keeps getting faster. And somehow we have to keep up because we just have to. So how do we do this when your job is highly stressful and demanding? when you've spent the last three months homeschooling and entertaining and caring for your kids, and now they're off for summer, so you had to be doing that anyway come this point. When you've just lost your job, when you're experiencing relationship breakdown and divorce, when you're sick and you have been for a while, how do we do this? Well, the thing about sitting at Jesus' feet and learning to sit at Jesus' feet is that it is a spiritual discipline. And spiritual disciplines, like any disciplines, are nurtured over a long period of time. Dallas Willard defines the spiritual disciplines like this. They're the, the activities of the mind and body purposefully undertaken to bring our personality and total being into effective cooperation with the divine order. Disciplines take time and if spiritual disciplines are the driving force that bring our total being, our mind and our body and our soul into cooperation with the divine order, then learning to sit at Jesus' feet will take time. So as you learn to do this and maybe as you continue to do this, be kind to yourself. Afford yourself extra grace and patience as you learn to be silent before him, to sit at his feet and to absorb his revelations. Eugene Peterson again encapsulates the Christian faith as a long obedience in the same direction, a long obedience. And Jesus modeled this for us. He didn't just have people sitting at his feet all the time. He first sat at the feet of others. In Luke 2, 41 to 47, we read this story. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the, the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, 
While his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him along uh, the way with their relatives and friends, but they did not find him. So they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. And after three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. And everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. Where was he? He was sitting among the teachers and he was just 12 years old. And similarly, um, throughout his, his adult life and in his ministry, he frequently found himself retreating to the quiet place to be at the feet of his father. Matthew fourteen twenty three says this. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountains by himself to pray. Mark 6, 46 says, After saying goodbye, he left for the mountain to pray. And Luke 5, 16 says, But Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness to pray. And you see, these just weren't a few one-offs for Jesus. This was a lifestyle. This was a way of life. This was his way of life. And if we're ever to be emotionally healthy and spiritually mature followers of Jesus, we must do as he did. We must allow ourselves to slow down and to sit at his feet, to allow his words and his revelations to teach us more about who he is and what he's doing in us and in the world. And this is what I believe will help lead us to emotional health and spiritually mature lives. But in choosing to sit, something even bigger is going on. Earlier I mentioned that life is a series of moments and that the church has had many defining moments known as revivals. And that those revivals don't start in some way off planet. They start within our own lives, in our own faith journeys. So if revivals um, are started within our own hearts. And, and, and when we choose to live in a revival way of life, we are one, becoming more spiritually mature and emotionally healthy, but we are also playing our part in bringing renewal and revival to our families and to our homes, to our friendship groups, to our workplaces and to our city. And when this happens, when we choose to slow down our pace of life to the pace that Jesus walked and we choose to position ourselves right at the feet of Jesus, when we learn to walk with him and live like him. This leads us down the path of renewal where God meets us in our everyday, where God is welcomed into the mundane and the spectacular of what it means to be human. Slowing and sitting will not only bring us to even greater Christ-likeness, but it will show the watching world another way. It will show them his way. After decades of uprising and revolution in South America, the Roman priest and theologian Ivan Illich was once asked, how do you change a society? Is it through violence and revolution and rebellion or is it small incremental change? And this was his answer, neither. The best way to change a society is to tell an alternative story. Through choosing to slow and sit at the feet of Jesus and become like him, we are demonstrating to the world an alternative story, an alternative way to experience life. And in doing so, we not only become emotionally healthy and spiritually mature, spiritually mature followers of Jesus, but uh, we are letting the world see Jesus and we are inviting them into his alternative way. That is why I believe that right now we as the church have such an opportunity to partner with God and let him partner with us in the moment that we are in as the church to realign ourselves to him, to slow down, 
to sit at his feet, to walk at his pace, to do as he did and become like him, to see his kingdom come in our lives and in Belfast as it is in heaven. Let's pray. Jesus, we come before you and we say sorry for how much we rush through life, how much we have become conditioned to just keep moving and keep pushing past what you're doing in us and in the moment that we find ourselves in. And Lord, we, we decide again to just come and sit at your feet, to let your words wash over us, to lead us to um, a transformed inner life, to let your words become the thing that we hang on. And God, we ask, would you change us from the inside out so that the watching world would not just see good people or see that we're doing this thing you know, off to the side with our own people doing our own thing, but they would see an alternative way, that they would see you in us and that that would compel them to want what it is that we have. Jesus, would you lead us to sit at your feet again? Would you help us to be disciplined? And would you give us extra grace and patience as we learn and relearn again and again to come and sit at your feet God, we pray for a revival and we pray for that to first happen in our own hearts, that we would become spiritually mature and we would become emotionally healthy and in doing so that we would lead others to do as we have done, to sit at your feet. And we ask this all in your name. Amen.